It's a pleasure to welcome Sakura back to Princeton. Uh, she's one of our non invertible symmetries. And as always, we'll go to dinner. Anybody is interested, just send me an email. Say four, four, five, so that I can four, four to make it clear, uh, so that I can make a reservation. Great. Thanks very much, Nadi. Thanks for having me here for the seminar. Um, I'll talk about non invertible symmetries and uh, I will start with sort of a very broad comment that, of course, in 2022, symmetries are thought of as topological operators in a quantum field theory quite generally. And that's, uh, I think, sort of a way we understand them in this particular moment in time. But of course, this goes back to, I think, in, in the core to 1918, at least, uh, where Noether wrote that paper, um, where she introduced these neutral charges, so to speak, in this case for Lie type symmetries, but of course for us, a lot of these symmetries will be discrete symmetries, but it goes in the core back to that idea. And <clears throat> so, although of course we have come a long way, the idea is still, so I think I'll use this pointer here because the pointer here doesn't matter. So uh, for a standard symmetry like the one that appeared in, in Neuter's paper, um, we would now say there's a point like operator and it is charged under a topological operator that is of co-dimension one, and that surrounds it, and uh, the operator carries the charge under that. And it's conserved. And the topological operator is exactly this here, and we can deform it, and that is done at no cost, and these dimensions are much relevant until we cross that operator. Okay, so of course, we've come a long way since the zero form symmetries as they're known now. Now we have actually seen many extensions of symmetries. And um, what I'd like to go through is sort of levels of complexity of generalized symmetries, starting with higher form symmetries and higher groups, and then to the topic of today's talk, which are non invertible symmetries, and then these categorical symmetries. So, higher form symmetries generalize this idea to simply saying now, Let's look at the extended operators that are charged under topological operators that are of co-dimension uh, P plus one if they are p-dimensional. So there are topological operators, I would label them by a subscript with a dimension, and the superscript will be either a group label or a slightly more common. As we'll see, it won't always be a group-like thing, but it'll be something that indexes this topological operator. And for these higher form symmetries, the generalization was done in this paper in 2014, Gallo, Christine, Seiberg, and Bullet, is to say we have these extended operators and they have still a fusion. If we bring two of them close together, insert them in a correlation function, then that's the same as inserting the bar. So you get G and H, then so those are G times H. So it is a group like higher form symmetry. The next extension is higher group symmetries, and higher group symmetries. Uh, somewhat natural in the sense that if you have a theory with multiple higher form symmetries, so zero form, one form, and so on, and these may be product groups, but they may also form somewhat generalized extensions. And these, this notion of these extensions are of higher group symmetries. And I actually give a little bit of detail here. I think this everyone is very familiar with. I'll talk a little bit about these higher group symmetries at the beginning of the talk. But all of these are still such that all the operators, the topological operators, satisfy this group fusion. And in point three and four, when we extend, we relax in that So you're actually saying if we fuse two of these topological operators, this may not actually result in just a group multiplication, but actually something that is more like a fusion algebra. So that's what we generally mean by non invertible. So non invertible because we usually don't have an inverse. What this fusion is. So once we actually go to this non invertible type symmetries, we can take sort of in a given d dimensional quantum field theory all the topological operators of dimension zero to d minus one, and then look at the complete set of such topological objects, and they generally form what's called the higher category or higher fusion category. And that's, I think, the structure that symmetries in quantum field theories need to be. Okay, so let me just briefly uh, go over what these higher groups are. Um, 
So we can start with a theory that has, for example, a zero form symmetry with just an ordinary global symmetry and a one form symmetry. And the structure I'm going to describe is what's called a two group symmetry. And it's very natural if you think in terms of group extensions. Let's just do it as a warm up, consider zero form symmetries um, that are not necessarily polar. So if you look at the finite groups of order four, exactly two such groups, one is Z2 times Z2, the Klein four group, and the other one is Z4. And they're distinguished precisely by how this extension sequence here splits or does not split. And this is characterized in terms of the cohomology, the group cohomology of Z2 with Z2, so H upper two of Z2 with Z2. So this group cohomology says that there is now a non-trivial extension that's the Z4 group. So this is what, how you would construct an extension group uh, for a zero form symmetry. And now the two group symmetries are essentially saying, well, now we can pick one of these actually be part of the one form symmetry. And the other one, so Z2A is a one form symmetry, Z2B is a zero form symmetry. And of course, now the question is what exactly does this extension mean? Physically, what it means is that the line operators that can be sort of you know, screened by local operators they can actually, the local operators can carry charge under the zero form symmetry or the flavor symmetry. And in that way, the zero form and one form symmetry uh, start interacting with each other. So they're not independent. Screen means an end point of a line operator. That's right. Yeah. So they have a line that can end a local operator, which now is also charged on the flavor symmetry. And that actually now means. Flavor that, symmetry just for zero form symmetry. That's right. So flavor symmetry is just gamma zero or G. It's always just. Uh, so in this case here, there's actually a continuous labor symmetry F, think of, for example, SU2. And then in fact, what happens is that the center of that is the Z2B, and that forms an extension with this one form symmetry. So more concretely, in terms of background fields for higher form symmetries, the one form symmetry has a background B2, and the flavor symmetry has a background B1, which is characterizing flavor symmetry bundle. And the statement of these two group is, that delta B2 is now the pullback of a class, which is called this Posnikov class, with respect to this bundle B1. So B1 is just a map from space time into the classifying space of this flavor symmetry group. And this class theta, this Posnikov class, is a cohomology class in H upper three of the classifying spaces, now coefficients in the one form symmetry. So this is sort of the key thing. This is non trivial. Then, in fact, there's a non trivial interaction between the zero and the one form symmetry. But physically, the picture is really we have now line operators uh, that can end on local operators and can get screened where fl flavor Wilson and lines actually can end. So, this seems actually a little bit more exotic, but the thing to remember is this appears in extremely simple quantum field series. So, you can pick 5D pure Sufian Mills. So this is the theory that Nani invented, the SD2 level zero SCFT that has a two group symmetry. There's a very simple set of examples in four dimensions, spin four n plus two with vector matter. And also in 16, many CFTs have these two groups. So the key is always to have, in fact, a non-simply connected flavor symmetry group and the zero form symmetry group that then forms an extension with this one form symmetry. So a representation that doesn't arise in the vacuum arises at the end of a line up here? That's right, yes. Please ask questions if there are questions about anything. Okay, so this is so far, everything still was invertible. Um, the zero for my continuity is simply not independent. Now, so, the, yes, yeah. going back, so yeah. the, the fractional hole effect, the Wilson line, there is fraction of charge. Is this an example of that or not? So do you have there are two types of symmetries, zero form and one form symmetries? So the key here is to have a zero form no. symmetry and a one form symmetry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So it's, it's I think it's different. So really the, the picture I have in mind is you have usually you say a line up or so the the one form symmetry with Pontiac and dual is really the set of line operators. L in your theory, modern line equivalence relation. It's called the line operators, modern equivalence relation. Equivalence relation says L1 and L2 are, sorry, are equivalent 
if there exists a local operator or one two, right, that forms a junction. This is what we call a one form symmetry, or it's Pontiac in door, because now we're talking about charged objects. So gamma one hat is on one. The case of the two group is where we now are now. Local operator. But now they also carry some flavor symmetry representation. One, and now we have well, two, R2. Two. And now we can have here one tensor R2 star. This is a flavor person. This is now some operator that carries both charges under flavor and gauge symmetry. And inside this group here, this is another equivalence relation which we define on such things. And the, the group that I get from the set of line operators modulo this relation is in fact precisely some extension group, group like it appears here. So this is the extension group that, that analyzes this two group symmetry. Okay. Anyway, my the talk will be mostly about not invertible things. So, yeah. yeah. that direction. So the, the in your fourth point, you mentioned the most general thing is some higher higher categorical structure. So do you get this two group uh, structure by restricting yourself to like invertible. Yes. Objects? So this is a particular class of um, if you want higher categories, mm -hmm. um, where everything is invertible. Everything still satisfies group law. Like this. And now we have Q equals to uh, co dimension one and co dimension two. Okay. So, yeah. see, going here, the other one was out to store. Mm -hmm. is, is this an operator that exists as a genuine point like operator in the theory or not necessarily? So, it is attached to a flavor with some line. So, it's not just a local operator that is, uh, right? So, here we could say, uh, Screening is if this is the trivial line, then the local operator is just an end of this Wilson line, operator, for example. And then what happens here is that you also have a charge under the flavor symmetry. So now I'm actually formulating a slightly more refined equivalence relation, which is not but just the charge, if, if, is the charge a charge that exists already for local operators in theory or not necessarily? It exists for local operators. Yes. So I can bring a local operator from the bulk and just attack it here. I think that is true. So let me go to the non-invertible symmetry. So here we relax this group like fusion and more generally will allow for the fusion of two of these topological operators to now be generally a sum. Of topological operators. So the labels here are I, J, and K, just some formal labels. Uh, we'll get to what they can be later on. So, of course, this structure is not totally alien to high energy physics because, of course, in two dimensional rational CFTs, the Verlinden lines, if P is one, we have topological lines in the rational CFT, and they form exactly a structure like this. So where n is essentially the diffusion coefficients. And also in three dimensions and context matter, there's been a lot of work on these kinds of structures, but in higher dimensions, so g bigger than three, and this is um, until a year ago, relatively uncharted. And what again, at least to me is quite surprising is these are ubiquitous type of symmetries. And of course, there's just to illustrate in a quantum field theory term, what kind of papers have appeared in the past year. Uh, there's been a lot of papers just studying in D bigger than three and non-invertible symmetries and their implications. So if we actually go even further and say we have a quantum field in D dimensions, then we allow ourselves topological defect of dimension zero until D minus one. And then I will form some complicated network of topological defects. They will have fusions, they will form junctions. So for example, if I'm in a three-dimensional theory, I would have surfaces. They could have line operators that are junctions between them. And these line operators could again themselves 
on coin side junctions. And this structure is what goes under the name of a two category and will generally be minus one category. And there's the, the formal sort of uh, nomenclature is that the objects are these surfaces, so the top dimensional defects. Then the morphisms are these junctions between objects and so on and so forth. So it's this kind of the structure that goes all the way to local operators. So generally in a quantum field theory, we would expect this kind of symmetry structure to be actually realized. And sometimes indeed it'll be simplified because there's invertibility, um, but we'll see that these only invertible structures are quite common. In practice, I think mathematically, extremely on firm footing is the case of two categories, the work of Douglas and Reuter, and of course in the context of literature by Wang, Tong, Barkesh, Lee, and Hugo And what I'll try to do in this talk here is two things. One is to actually uh, exemplify this in a more high energy physics approach. How do we see these non invertible symmetries in three dimensional and four dimensional quantum field series? And, and then concretely describe these two category like structures. And then also switching somewhat gear, but conceptually, there's a connection between these two, two parts, is to actually show how these things occur in a more stringy holographic kind of setting. You might have also some nice physical implications. And the key tool in both of these things is a notion of generalized gauging. So you all know how to gauge the symmetry say, in two dimensions. And here we'll have to generalize this notion somewhat. So usually the starting point will be a quantum field theory with some invertible symmetry. And then we start gauging that invertible symmetry. So it's some zero form symmetry and we gauge that symmetry and that will result in something that is of this higher categorical or non-invertible nature. Okay, so the plan of the talk is to explain this generalized gauging and go concretely into what are these two categorical symmetries, and then to actually give an example in a holographic setting. And this is work in collaboration with my postdocs, Laksha Bardash, Jing Xiang Wu, my student, Lea Bottini, and Akov Tivari, who's a condensed matter theorist, and then uh, Fabio Ruzzi, Iguba, and Federico Bonetti. And these are the order of one, two, and three. Okay. And any questions so far? I have a question. So, in the um, so one natural way to produce some fusion categories to sort of instead of studying defects, you study boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there will be no fusion structure, but you can get a fusion structure by sort of stacking two boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. Do you know if like that's like that's like enough to like studying boundary conditions is it enough to give you the full uh, space of interfaces? Yeah, so there's a sense in which the, actually in this generalized gauging, there is in a way um, discussion of, you'll, you'll see it, um, of sort of a left action, which is kind of like a bounded condition. And I think to actually get really this gauging consistency, you have to do, do compatibility of left and right action, and there's a structure of bi module. So maybe this is what you're referring to. Maybe we can maybe discuss it once I get to it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'll just start with uh, this generalized gauging um, discussion, and I want to begin with something we all know very well, which is two-dimensional quantum field theories, and where gauging of the zero-form symmetry is uh, just obvious thing. So I want to formulate in terms of these topological line operators. So I start with a two-dimensional theory. It has a zero-form symmetry G, and G for me will be discrete. It'll be, it'll be a finite group. Um, it doesn't have to be a billion, but it, it needs to be a finite group. And I'd like to learn how to actually gauge that symmetry in the setup. And of course, we all know how to do this, but I want to describe it in a slightly different way that generalizes to high dimensions. So the symmetries of this theory are generated by topological lines. And again, these are now labeled by group elements, G, and they form, uh, so under this multiplication, and under diffusion will be exactly a group multiplication. And as a fusion category, this is actually just what is called the vector G, so the G graded vector spaces. Um, that's this category. So, this is a symmetry that acts on two dimensional theory, and I'd like to gauge the symmetry. 
Um, and so one way of thinking about this is uh, couple it to a G background. And one way of doing this in terms of these topological lines is we now take this two dimensional space time and actually throw a mesh of D1 of, of lines associated to this symmetry like G. So I have some network of lines of type D1G. And then I can sort of think of this as coupling the backgrounds. So normally, would couple the background and some over exactly uh, the background. But what's the difference between vec G and rep G? Uh, we will get to rep G in a moment. Vec G is just G graded vector spaces. It's not a representation category. This is literally what I defined here. Okay. And you have essentially topological lines, and they fuse according to the group one. Whereas rep G will fuse according to representation tensor products. So in this category, there's one object for every group element. Yeah. Okay. So now we'd like to gauge that symmetry. And gauging now means um, about one thing is I would like to gauge the symmetry, but also now figure out what actually is the symmetry of this gauge theory. So what are the line operators that I have in the gauge theory? One way of thinking about this is. It's exactly those lines, D1, where I can move them through the mesh. They are blind to this mesh of D1G lines. And to solve this sort of more formally, what we have to do is start with these D1G lines. And then sort of here, I'd like to solve for these lines here. And I can end them. And that needs to be done consistently with the fusion of these lines in back G. So for example, if I end them, or if I fuse them first and then end them, then it needs to be consistent. So this is what you would call a left action of this G on the, on the line defect. And of course, I also want to do this from the right. And these two things should be compatible such that if I move this topological line through this mesh, it's completely aligned to the, the mesh that I actually put down on this uh, two-dimensional space-time. So these D1G lines are invisible to the lines in the theory T mod G. And so mathematically, the structure of what I just explained, this coupling from the left and from the right and the compatibility conditions um, of these, these uh, things, uh, they are precisely what are called bimodular conditions. Um, um, not quite the full category. So mathematically, what you actually have to take is a sub that an algebra object inside the category like G. So the fact that it's an algebra object just says that the mesh doesn't depend on how precisely I've triangulated uh, the space and how I put down the mesh, I can do operations and sort of do- um, You needed that to define the mesh. Right? That's right, absolutely. I didn't want to start off with the facts immediately, but exactly I needed to define that to right, make sure that if I now make some moves, here that it doesn't be associated to so this algebra object, I picked an algebra object here inside the VEC G category. And if I now construct the bimodules of VEC G for this algebra, so it's really an algebra, it's sort of asking the modules from the left and the right and compatibility. This is exactly the category VEC G. But this is not a representation category for the group G. So this is how we go from Vec G, which is the symmetry of the theory before gauging, to Rec G. And this, of course, generalizes to higher categories. So canonical algebra when you make that kind of work? So uh, this is a choice. Oh, the you make that choice. You could also gauge a subgroup yeah, and then true. actually gauge, for example, just H inside here, and you would get some Vec uh, G, Vec H with Rep H, and then uh, back of the the coset. Um, it's actually more, much more complicated to do subgroup gauging, um, in particular for these higher category cases. But yeah. This is a choice, which means I gauge the full G group and then I get that G. Yeah. Is there some assumption of gap of anomalies? Yeah, so I assume that I can actually gauge this. Mm -hmm. What are the morphisms in this category? So in Rep G, the morphisms are you have a representation. I meant in Rep G. Hmm? I meant in the previous one in Vec G. Well, it's, they're kind of trivial. They say you have this junction between them. If they, these are the same, right? So mm -hmm. it's like G and H. You can't join them unless they're the same. Here, they are basically intertwiners between representations. Well, so sorry, I, I, meant, I meant to ask so, uh, two uh, objects, D1G and D1H. 
So what is the space of morphisms between them? Is it just uh, trivial and thus one is the inverse of the other? Yeah, so in this case here, it's the intertwiners between the representations. There are R1, R2. They can be a local operator compatible with the G action, which is an intertwiner. Okay, so this is the, the so one way of thinking about gating. So of course, this rep G is not completely surprising that that's the result of the gauging. That's just the dual symmetry when we orbit for the two-dimensional theory. So what essentially is the more physics picture we would do is we would start with the Wilson lines for G. We have now gauge field A, the limit gauge field, we've built these Wilson lines and they're characterized by G representations. Now we can take fusions of these Wilson lines and they will fuse according to how you know, representations tend to fall out in this rep G. And again, the intertwiners are the junctions. That's if G is abelian, this whole thing simplifies, then rep Zn is just, again, just the characters. And so that's just the Pantrabi towards the end. And of course, we can uh, you know, start with spec G, go to rep G, and we can also gauge back. That's not too much. Okay, so these are two pictures of the same thing. Now I want to take a third picture, and this is the one that I'll generalize to high dimensions. Can we discuss the orbital test for a second? Yeah. If you orbital by some group, possibly you want to go in, then the state space you get is graded, I thought, by conjugacy classes of the group. Yes. And you're claiming an action of line operators that correspond to representations of the group. Yes. So I think. I, for, I can't quite see it in physical terms. The act has characters on the. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's for the abelian case. This is this here. Well, what I said makes sense, not a Yes. We order for by maybe the constitutional group. Yes. And the states are labeled by conjugacy classes. Mm -hmm. And then each defect will be labeled. I think conjugacy classes basically, so I will discuss this in, for example, in, in the, um, you'd like to see how I map this to representations. Well, I'd like to know how to construct the line operators associated to representations. From the conjugacy classes. Anyway, I don't care. I'm not picking. <laughs> okay, so here I'm just constructing them from the gauge field. Oh, if I have a, a gauge field for the symmetry G. And um, well, if I have a state on a circle labeled by representation, yeah. a conjugate class, I mean, yeah. an act with an operator mm -hmm. that's labeled by representation, yeah. do I get the value? Character. The character. It's a character. Okay. But this is so sort of exactly. Um, so it's diagonal on that basis. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what I'd like to do so is. What is the group? Yes. You said that there's a new group that comes in. So that's a dual? Yeah, that's just a dual group. Okay. The N goes to the N half. Well, for a non abelian group, it's not really a group. It's not a group. No. And that's where the non invertibility comes in. So the way I want to actually think about this gauging is in this third way, which is what we generalize in higher dimensions. So if we start with a two-dimensional theory again with a zero form symmetry G, um, I want to start with this theory. So think of this as a two-dimensional theory. Now I take a product with a one-dimensional TQHP that has also a zero form symmetry G. So I call these one G TQHPs. And then I take this product and now gauge the diagonal. What happens in this is these two decoupled systems, this topological set of TQHTs uh, actually becomes now a topological set of defects in the gauge theory. And in fact, so if this what used to be a decoupled set now it actually becomes one non-trivial theory with these topological line defects. So in this picture here, um, the one the GTQFTs are precisely actually in rep G to see this as well. They're characterized by the number of vacua and how G acts on these. And so they're labeled by G representations. And the junctions are then given in terms of intertwiners of these representations. And so in this way, I can think of these defects that are generators of this dual symmetry that is rising off by TQ, stacking TQFTs 
with the G symmetry and engaging our atom symmetry. So this is always giving the same result. It's always that G, but in fact, this is the one that actually will very nicely generalize to higher dimensions. So if you start, for example, now with a higher dimensional theory, so this is some example of d-dimensional theory T, I can take the T cube T with G symmetry, the product with this theory T, and then I actually gauge the diagonal, and then I'll get these co-dimension additional topological defects. Sorry, where, where does this T cube T that you added, where does it leave on the whole space? So I'm stacking this on top of this theory. So indeed, here, this was the two-dimensional space. When indeed I put it in the full space, there's a one-dimensional topological one. So, so to say, or topological theory in, in the space. And I can gauge now the diagonal G symmetry. And in this gauge theory, these now become part of the actual gauged theory, T mod G. And these are precisely these dual defects. What's the role of the stuff that you had? Couldn't you just gauge before? Yeah, so it's, it's indeed, these are precisely the same as the rep G guys you got from the gauging. But in higher dimensions, we'll see that this is a way of now getting the full information of you know, what, what, what actually is the substructure. It will not just be, uh, you know, rep G, it'll be a higher category. And so it's quite useful to det detangle it from the original theory. And so take this stacking approach. You take the theory times T, Q of T, and then gauge the diagonal symmetry. And so in, in general, this G, T, Q of T, in fact, will give rise to a D minus one category. And generalizing from this rep G picture, this will be a D minus one rep G category. So it has objects um, of dimension D minus one, homomorphisms, and so on. And of course, you can also do this for T form symmetries. So we have some SPTs which have which are protected by some, uh, which, which carry some p-form symmetry, take the product and gauge this p-form symmetry, and then this becomes topological defects in the resulting theory. So what I'd like to actually do before explaining exactly what this process is in, in, in a two-category way is to just give you an example to make this a bit more concrete, what kind of theories we're actually talking about. Because I was promising you these will be actually gauge theories where these symmetries will be realized. So if we take the three-dimensional pure angle, pure gauge theory, so it's just a nose with gauge group PSO4N. Um, PSO4N is simply you take your simply connected group and you gauge the full center symmetry. So this is spin for N mod the center. This is PSO4N. Then the very now you have in the Z2 times Z2 will be now magnetic zero form symmetry. And this actually will be extended by the action of the outer automorphism that acts on the Lincoln diagram. So now the Z2 to a non-abelian group. And this is here PSO4N has a D8 zero form symmetry. So this is all just to motivate this. This is the important statement. The D8 zero form symmetry acts on this PSO4N TV gauge theory. And now we can say that, in fact, this theory here is now has topological defects of dimension two. And they form a tool category, which is a generalization of the back G category to two vector spaces. It's called two vector G. I'll discuss exactly what it is in a moment. And then if you gauge everything, then you get the two representations of the A. And that's precisely the symmetries of the pin plus one theory, which we expect to be, which is the dual to PS of one after we gauge its full zero. I'm sorry, if you gauge. This full D8. Yeah. In addition to the PSON, yeah. then you end, is that the claim that you end yeah. up with? So the here, this is the picture. Forget this, this comment here for a moment. So you start with spin for N, then you know if you take spin for N, you just gauge the outer automorphism, you get to pin plus. But you could also, what I'm trying to describe here is this arrow here. So if you start with spin for N and gauge the center, you get to this PSO for N. That has a non abelian zero form symmetry. And the symmetry category is two by eight. And now I can gauge the full symmetry and that gets us to pin plus one. It's just of reverting this line. And that's it. that is now a representation category for the yeah. Is there any difference between the diagonal line and the, 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 the There isn't, but there is 
that, no, this, this is completely, everything is inverted. All these arrows, you could go from here, gauge the zero form Z2 times Z2, and then gauge this here. But what I'm trying to describe is how we get from gauging a zero form symmetry using the stacking of the QFTs to the dual sort of symmetry in higher dimensions. And this is that arrow. So this is just a, an example so that I can see exactly this connection so from two back to two back. And so that's sort of an example you can keep in mind. One question is what exactly is now this two back G, or two back G exactly. So that's what I want to describe in a little bit more detail. So we're looking at two fusion categories, object the surfaces. For example, they could be invertible, um, but the morphisms are topological lines, and then the two morphisms are zero-dimensional topological operators. And we have fusions at all these levels, and the generic configuration of defects would be something like this. So when you gauge these two categories, again. Uh, two ways of thinking about this. One is in terms of this bimodular approach that I was talking about earlier in this two-dimensional case. So here, coupling to a G background means insert now a two-dimensional mesh of the two surfaces. And then what we have to solve for is actually conditions that are the bimodular conditions now for algebras in the two category. So we are solving for these D2 surfaces where we can end surfaces from this algebra that we picked in these two categories. And uh, we have to solve these types of toxicity conditions from the left, from the right, the compatibility. So that can be done and it's a paper by, by the Darren group that actually also follows this path. And what I'd like to discuss today is actually the stacking of the QFPs that have the G symmetry. So right, the philosophy was we start with a theory we take a product with a GTQFT, in this case, two dimensional TQFT, and then we gauge the diagonal, and that should give us the full symmetric structure. So, what are actually two dimensional TQFTs? I'm thinking of single singles of finite TQFTs, I'm ignoring this Euler counter term. So, they're characterized by the number of vacua, so some integer, and then they essentially give in terms of you know, n times the trivial TQFT. And then they have a space of local operators. We have some very simple sort of uh, algebra. And then defects are basically domain walls between these vacua. And they need to compose uh, according to whether it's actually adjacent to And what this sort of is, is a generalization of a vector, the category of vector spaces, now to two vector spaces. And they have a fusion defined on them. I take Tn, tensor Tn, it will just be Tn common. This is the structure of what back to back is. And now the question is, what is the G symmetric version of that? So a theory with a zero form symmetry, if the, a T, Q of T in two dimensions, if it has a single vacuum, it's basically an SPT phase. So it's just characterized by some element alpha and H2 G with one coefficients. And if actually I have multiple vacua, then I can have in a given vacuum, GE symmetry or spontaneous symmetry breaking. So I can actually have this vacuum characterized by subgroup. And then on that, in, in the particular for this particular symmetry breaking uh, kind of uh, the vacuum uh, theory, I can also then have a co-cycle uh, in H2 of the subgroup. And then each of these GTQFTs will be labeled by subgroup and co-cycle. And now these are like simples in this category and you can take the sum over these. This theory would then, for example, have uh, G mod H many, the sum of G mod H many vacuum. Okay, so this is sort of the set of G T Q T Q of T. And in fact, they have a very nice, very simple formula in terms of how they fuse. So if I take the fusion of H alpha H and K alpha K, so these are just subgroups and co labeled topological defects, and there's a very nice explicit formula. What exactly? Yeah. Sorry? Well, what exactly are the objects? The objects. So these are surfaces, which are essentially, right? So before I was just talking about GTQFTs. 
So they're characterized by either just uh, SPTs or they're characterized by subgroup and co cycle. And now I gauge the theory, I, I stack them on top of the theory, I gauge them, and they become now defects on the gauge theory. So these are now topological defects in the gauged theory, T mod G. So they are along the line? They are topological surfaces. So D sub two. So they cover the whole space time. No, it's in three dimensions. Right? I'm now doing the two categorical case. So I'm at least in three dimensions. I have surface operators. Yeah. So right? I'm starting with, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of doing two categories, two fusion categories. I'm at least in, in, in three dimensions. So these are surfaces that are now fusing in this way. And this is precisely the diffusion that uh, the, so the objects in uh, this dual category uh, rep um, G, 2 FG should have. Just, just to clarify, so a two vector space of, let's say, dimension n is this, uh, is this notion of we have this n copies of the trivial P. Mm -hmm. yeah. so now I'm representing basically G on such an object. Actually, it may be useful to do an example. Uh, the one that really was relevant for this gauge theory that I was discussing is the eight. It becomes a bit unwielding when we just discussed the two theory. So if I take G equals G2, I have subgroups one or Z2, and then the co-cycle is trivial because you have co-cycle. And the objects are labeled by subgroups. So either H equals trivial or Z2. And what are these objects now? Well, this is precisely TQFT that has two vacua, so plus and minus. So that's actually the non trivial defect. And TQFT is one vacuum, which is a trivial uh, defect. And now we can, so just in terms of you know, how the diffusion is just calculated in terms of how these uh, vacua will now uh, take each other. So the, one, the single vacuum one. Or just use as identity, identity, identity. And the interesting one, Sahan will uh, detect immediately what this is e to minus with e to minus, uh, that can be a structure two times e to minus. So this is actually what you can do as well as a condensation defect for Z2. So this is the structure. So actually, what this after we computed the fusion for the surfaces and also the lines and so there's a bit more than I'm telling you, this becomes this category two rep C2. It has these two objects, and then there are morphisms between them, and then there are also endomorphisms of each object. But the general lesson is sort of starting with three-dimensional theory with, with the symmetry G, zero form symmetry, that'll have a, a symmetry category. This two by G, I gauge that I get the two representations of G as the symmetry category of the dual uh, of the gauged CMT module. And this is just this comment that indeed these defects that we get now and they're related to these condensation defects, where now the defect D to H alpha H corresponds to one gauging of H um, uh, on the given surface. This is a sort of construction of the condensation defects using um, the stacking of the QFTs. Okay. So, we, of course, it, there are not just these global forms that I was talking about spin, PS, or pin plus. There's also P4N. Now we can start filling out these webs, and we can also uh, continue sort of uh, constructing now also intermediate gauging like SO, and so more generally. In D dimensions, you expect a very complicated you know, D, D minus one categorical web where each of these global forms of the gauge group will have some categorical symmetry attached to it. It will generically be non invertible symmetries. Of course, this begs some questions because um, it, it seems like we, we just did one of these steps from PSO to PIN plus. Uh, is there actually sort of a unifying picture? And indeed, something that sort of is, is interesting to, to think about is um, how one could actually construct this from uh, a more sort of systematic first principle perspective. And I'll comment on that in a second. There are two extensions. So one is, but maybe I'll explain this first. So you can think of 
not the theorem in D dimensions and its symmetries, but in fact, you can think about what's called the symmetry TFT, which is a deep one dimensional topological field theory that they admit some gap boundary conditions. So it sits somewhere here. This is where the physical boundary condition lives. This is where the gap boundary condition lives. And this is potentially an anomaly theory. And as we now collapse this here, we should be getting the physical theory possibly with an anomaly. And so in this picture, the way you should think about these different gaugings is different boundary conditions for the symmetry GFT. So one example is the Chorai Bureau series in three dimensions. If you impose different boundary conditions for them, you get fusion categories at the boundary, and many fusion symmetries will have the same Chorai Bureau box theory. And so what would be very nice is for these higher categories to construct this sort of um, arc symmetry TFT. So mathematically, what this is is the so-called Grinfeld center, where it's characterized by the Grinfeld center of this fusion two category. So it's one of the, the things that also in mathematics seems to be interesting. It's uh, that has done most of this work on uh, the Grinfeld center categories. Um, Grinfeld center gives you an ordinary category? Uh, it's, okay. it's also two category here. Oh, it's. So the, the Drinfeld center, for example, for two vec G is again something like the sum of two vec H's with certain conditions on H. Okay, so this is one extension. And the other one is um, that so far we were always stacking TQFTs that were just GTQFTs or essentially SPTs plus symmetry breaking. Um, in three dimensions, if you have a topological defect that's three dimensional, you can have actually non trivial topological orders. You can stack a full modular tensor category with a G symmetry. And in fact, you could have something that doesn't have an SSL gap power. So the stacking of these GTQFTs will be vastly sort of extended once we go to these three dimensional effects. And we see an example in the second part of the talk where we have precisely some stacking with the theory that's a one in a one. So there are some extensions that need to be considered. So actually, Igor just blocked them, so it's perfect timing for me to go with the homeopathic <laughs> the realization of non avoidable symmetries. And that it actually did some kind of questions about the first part. You mentioned fusion. Uh, yeah. Is there also a grading? So there is a notion of higher S matrix. But that is, I think, by, by Reuter and uh, um, Johnson Frey, they're so, I think, working out what exactly that is. I think that's a great question. Sorry, it was due to circumstances beyond my control. No, no, but it's perfect timing because now, um, I was I was trying to make a smooth transition, but in fact, it's also nice to just stop and say, well, no, actually, these are not the symmetries in a holographic setting. Um, and these two extensions that I mentioned actually become very uh, sort of um, apparently realized here. The first central connection is that the sim TFT is really something we know very well from holography, it's namely the topological couplings in a holographic higher theory. And I'll give you a concrete example of that in the context of this dual to put in with one superannuals. Okay, so the first extension I said was we would like to learn also how to stack beyond you know, just the uh, SPTs uh, and symmetry breaking. So in a four dimensional theory, we could have topological defects that are three dimensional. And in fact, we can stack a GTQFT that doesn't necessarily have a gap boundary condition. And this happens precisely for pure n equals one to be else. So we know that SUM, where the group is simply connected, group in this case has M confined molecular, and everything is invertible. It's invertible center symmetry, one form symmetry. And, and one question you could ask is what about PSUM? And so the global form uh, of the, the symmetry for the SUM theory uh, is, is sort of you have a one form symmetry, the center, and you also have a chiral symmetry, which is sort of what's left over from the one R symmetry, um, which is a Z2M symmetry. Let's say it has background field A1 and the one form symmetry is background B2. 
So normally we would say to get PSUM, we just gauge this one form symmetry center. The problem is this here has a mixed anomaly. Um, it's given by A1 conjugate instead of B2, which is B2 plus B2. So normalization, this is actually a, a, a mixed toft anomaly between these two uh, symmetries. So this entails something for the topological defects in the So if you actually start with the um, topological defect that generates the zero form symmetry, so that's defined on a three manifold, because of this mixed anomaly, as we do background gauge transformations for gamma one, it picks up this additional factor. We cannot just simply gauge the one form symmetry because this topological defect actually is very fine. So before we actually gauge it, we need to remedy this anomalous transformation. And one way of doing this is we stack it with a three-dimensional TQFT that has precisely the opposite anomaly and also has a one form symmetry. So this is sort of the point that one form has this anomaly, or it's minus the anomaly. And in fact, there are many such TQFTs, but actually Nadia and his students in LAM, they actually classified what are actually such TQFTs. And in this particular case, it's very well defined. It's a new one of right transparency theory that does the job. And this is precisely this construction of Kaidi and Mori Zing now formulated in terms of so the TQFT stacking. Uh, I was motivating in the first part of the talk. So what actually happens when we, we do this? So we have a minimal TQFT, this is U1 level M, it has the anomaly to cancel this anomalous transformation of the zero form symmetry generator. Now we can take this generator of the zero form, stack on top of this U1 level M, and this object is now well defined. And I can gauge the one form symmetry. And the fusion of these is known from, from the paper by Nadi and Students. And so this allows us now to compute the fusion of this operator. And so in the PSUM theory, the fusion of these dressed operators is now actually given in terms of N1 with N1, so the generators of this dual sim of, of these M symmetries, Z2 M symmetry is given in terms of the element 2, but then dressed with a TQFT. And if you take N with N dagger, the interesting thing is we get now a two dimensional operator. So these are just three factors, which is the other characteristic on two. This is just D2 and two. So this what is actually then hmm? what is this curly N? So curly N is the dressed defect. So D3 was the generator of the zero form symmetry and had this anomalous transformation due to the due to this mixed anomaly. Right? So oh, I, see. I had a mixed anomaly, zero and one form. The zero form has a generator, which is co dimension one operator. It has this anomalous variation. To remedy that, we start here to U1 level M, AM, comma one theory on top, and that's now N. But N is now the object that has non invertible fusion. And it's non invertible in the sense that the coefficient is a TQFT. If you take N with N dagger, we get actually something that's localized on a two manifold. And actually, this is just a condensation defect for the one form symmetry. So it's a trivial defect that we would normally expect from an invertible symmetry, right? It's just the identity, but now we gauge the one form symmetry. So this is what's known as the condensation. So it is this fusion that we now would like to see in the holographic dual set. Um, very quickly, so the, the conjectures, there's a dual description in terms of the kernel of solution. We start with ND3 as a conifold, that the super conifold filtering. Um, and then we add on top of that the five banks. So the conifold uh, is a cone of a T11. T11 is a slightly Einstein manifold that's topologically S3 times S2. And now wrapping these D5s on S2 breaks the conform invariance in the dual and introduces this additional flux. So the dual is a cascade of cyber dualities, which if you choose N and M to be just multiples, integer multiples of each other, flows to an SUM N plus one to the MSC. But the key is I'm now very picky and saying SUM algebra because at this point we have not specified yet what global form we picked. So locally it's very roughly the solution looks like there's a radial direction R, and then there's this T11. And the horizon is, and R goes to R0, and we also take R0 then to infinity. 
And importantly here, we have not fixed the global form yet. Okay, so how do we actually detect global forms of, uh, of uh, age groups and holography? Let's go back already to the 1998 paper uh, by, by Edward here. Um, if you take N equals four, for example, so we have those, then from the topological, from the transcendence coupling, um, in on the coupling F5, B2, DC2, and 10 dimensions, integrating over the F5, we get an N, B2, DC2, BF coupling. And now actually studying this BF theory as a leading term close to the horizon actually tells us a lot about the choices of the global form. So one way of thinking about this is B2 and C2 are now um, the background fields for the one form symmetry, the ZN one form symmetry, and you can construct the surface operators um, using them to e to the integral b2 or e to the integral c2. So those are the Wilson or Toft surface operators. And in fact, because these are actually the fluxes are not commuting, these surface operators don't commute. So if I exchange them, I pick up uh, a factor, which is dependent on the intersection of the two surfaces. And in fact, the global form is picked out by picking a maximum commuting subset. So this is pretty, at this point, extremely long. What's the phase? Hmm? What's the phase there? The phase here is coming from the, the this is essentially uh, the two surfaces, and they can have an intersection. Yes. So this is just saying that if I take in the bulk. Is the exponent integer or not? Um, I can't read from here. I think it is an in, it's not an integer, no. So this this here can be actually it's like a, a it's it's it will depend on the should be an n one over n. So oh, that would answer my question. That's right. So, so the, the point is that they don't actually commute with each other. But once you put boundary conditions, um, for example, b two is Neumann, c two is Dirichlet, then they actually become commuting uh, a maximum commuting subset. So the Neumann ones will become the symmetry generators on the boundary, and the Dirichlet ones are the line operators. So this is just a BF coupling. But now, of course, the question is, what is it in terms of the uh, terminal stressor solution? And the topological couplings in that theory are, they contain also something like this BF coupling, a BF coupling for the zero form, and it's dual, and then some couplings that are due to this anomaly. So this A1 G2 squared is precisely the imprint of this mixed anomaly that we see from the uh, So here A1 is the R symmetry background, B2, C2 come from the NSMS and our R fields. And then F bar, these, these superscripts little b are just integral with to some cohomologies like Z to M or Z M code. So the key is the F theory plus some additional couplings which are like mixed anomalies. So now what we'd like to do is construct, like in this BF theory in N equals four, the generators of the symmetries. And the constructive way of doing this is to actually compute the house law. So we think of this as the radial direction is like you play in time. And then you can check the Gauss law constraints and they will generate the symmetry when they exponentiate them, will generate the symmetries. And different boundary conditions will then result in the symmetry generators on um, the boundary theory. So for example, if this two form field is Dirichlet, and in fact, we just because we get here to exponentiate this Gauss law constraint for C3, this is basically a two form field square, it's just a number times C3. So this is an invertible symmetry, that's just the same pair symmetry, the zero form symmetry for SUM. However, if you take now D2 to be Neumann, then in fact, we actually get this operator here after some suitable taking the nth root of this. And this actually is precisely C3, but dressed with some additional uh, security. And this is the operator now, if you compute the fusion of this with itself, that mimics exactly the non involved diffusion in the dual field set. So that's not actually miraculous because this is, indeed, it just generates the same type of topological operator as we had in the field theory. So that's what holography should do. But what I think is a little bit more surprising is this is what I really want to get. I'm, I'm not out of time, but I really want to tell you this. So give me 
three minutes. So start, we started late. Huh? Started late. So. Okay, but I mean, this is really the thing I want to tell you about because it's a bit unexpected. Um, so the proposal is that we can construct to the Gauss law symmetry generators. That's, I think, a relatively old story. But we can also think about it in terms of the following. Um, we place brains in, at the near horizon, so it's taking the horizon to infinity effectively. And the brains placed at that location will, in fact, furnish symmetry generators. So they become like topological operators. So if I place a brain at the boundary, the tension would go like R to the P for P to R to zero. And so if I take R to infinity, essentially everything decouples from the brain effective action. And the only thing that remains are topological couplings from the rest of the neutron. So this is sort of similar to in the case of these B2 DC2 theories, that that's the only thing that we have to care for is sort of these, these topological terms. And in fact, for the brains in this Stavnostasla setup, what actually happens is if I take now D5 brain, wrap it on S3 times uh, three manifold in, in space time, take the near horizon limit, I get precisely just these topological couplings. Again, that is a C3 field, and then uh, a P1 gauge field. Assume you mean one over two pi. Mm -hmm. Assume you need one over two pi. Uh, yes. So, but the key is that I have the C3 and then my V1 gauge field coupled to VB1. You should think of this V1 as really DV1 as uh, the sort of Stickelberg dual to uh, the two form G2 that I have earlier. But again, this topological term, if I exponentiate this here, I think of this as how modeling symmetry generators imposing Neumann boundary conditions used as SRAM. Here's the boundary conditions gives us PSUM, and the dressing by this UN level and transignment is precisely giving this non inverting open. So the top of the brains become topological operators, and they have the, the correct kind of uh, structure. And now the fusion, again, I can compute the fusion field theoretically exponentiating this and calculating the field theory. The really nice thing is if I now just Ask what happens if I take two of these brains near the horizon and fuse them, what do I get? So naively, it's a U2 monobian theory, right? It's a stack of two brains. That would not be quite the correct thing because we know the fusion should just give us N3, one N3, one into N3, two. These are all abelian QFTs. But actually what happens here is because there's flux through the S2, the two flux of the S2, these 2D5 brains actually pass out and the Borbeyans is that they become a single receptor. So the fusion that we have from the um, field theory, this non-invertible fusion, is realized automatically in terms of the brains uh, thanks to this Myers effect. So for example, two of these D5, this B2 become a D7. The effective field theory on this D7 with flux looks like this. And I can rewrite this simply as the N2 two times this coefficient. And of course, sort of the, the, the final sort of nice check is if I take now the brain and the downtap brain and con, con, uh, sort of put them together, then I expect there to be actually a remnant which is coming from pattern condensation of the remnant of this. So actually, the condensation defects are really coming from condensation of the pattern. Okay, and finally, um, last point is. How do these operators act on now charged line operators? So in this setup, the charged operators, the line operators come from these three brains that stretch radially and that is two times this one. So this gives rise to top lines in this PSGM theory. And the, I was saying the topological defects are defined brains. So the wrappings are like this. This is the S2, this is the S3, this is the radial direction. And we can see that these actually have an non-trivial linking in the X3 direction. So in fact, if I take a D3 and a D5, and I pass the D3 through the D5, actually I have to preserve this linking number. And what happens is, this picture here, 
past the three sort of five, which you have to create is a fundamental string. And this is precisely what actually the top loop, as it goes through this non invertible defect, should do, that it actually becomes attached to a flux. So the string theory, the, the Hanani Witten effect, which is precisely this here, knows exactly about how these defects act on the line operators. Okay, I will leave and you. That's supposed to be a confining string on the way. Uh, so this is actually uh, like a flux, it's e to the integral b2, it's like a flux tube that is filling out this top line. But some story that uh, there is a kind of half string. Yes, so this is like a half string. That is a and then you cross and you create a whole string. So, yes. so the half string changes orientation. It even happens in flat space, right? <laughs> when Yes. When two brains uh, which fill eight dimensions cross to each other, yes. D zero D eight. Yeah. So this is literally in flat space, right? So <laughs> they're wrapping internally from the stuff, but uh, this is happening in the flat, in the, in the M four in, in the full in the commercial space, right? The four dimensional space. So. Yeah. Anyway, so I'll leave you with. A quick summary. Um, we talk about generalized gauging. Um, there are lots of questions, but I think the most interesting questions are how are actually uh, these non invertible symmetries acting on physical operators, like in this last example? I think there's a lot to be understood in terms of how they are represented on actual physical defects. There are also many interesting sort of actual physics applications coming up. Right? Not just in confinement, but also high on decay, neutrino masses, etc. So I think it's a very healthy, very active kind of subject to think about. Thanks very much. And sorry for one. In the end, you show that there is a map the phenomena, the spin construction in mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. So in one direction, it's quite clear that it has to work. Maybe yes. any phenomenon that you have in you must have it low energy field field in the structure. But is it clear that it works also the other way? So imagine there would be some kind of a non-invertible object or something in field theory. Is it clear that there has to be a counterpart of that in string theory? If I have a realization of the field theory in terms of either geometric engineering or holography, I would expect. But it could be that there are some observables. Um, it's a question. Can, can there be observables, some phenomenal interest in the field theory that do not have a counterpart in the string construction? It's much nicer if the answer is no. Yes. I, mean, I have no proof. I think whenever we have, um, it, it could be that certain things are not manifest in the string construction. If you could have asked the same question about this confinement in wood angles one in the construction of the same theory using a conical G2 manifold, a singular G2 manifold. In that case, the, the R symmetry is not really manifest. So you, the seeing, for example, just this A1, B2 squared anomaly extremely difficult. So we tried this for a long time. So some things may not be immediately realized in the string theory. I think it's I'm not sure it's a real obstruction. But I think it, in certain instances it happens. And so in the holographic setting, all of that is much more I don't think there's a theoretical sense it has to be I think it should be asked. <laughs> I don't know whether there are questions or comments. Can you say a little bit about the nature of the fusion coefficients of fused two D dimensional defects? Yeah. Those NIJKs, what are they actually? So, as far as we know so far, is they can be generally uh, TQFTs. Like you saw in this fusion, they can be TQFTs. Um, like you want level 
and the trunk signs are like these AM compared to minimal PSPs. And there's a way to express that in the higher category. Yeah. And that's a very good question. So that's something that uh, yeah, we're trying to understand. Really match these two languages of mathematicians write down as two fusion categories to really see yeah. how that talks. You note that this particular example right, uses these these uh, theories that are not just SPT phases, right, when we stacked. So it's not necessarily in the class of theories that I discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. So in short, I don't know what is the full categorical description of this particular theory. Mm -hmm. No more questions. We should thank Thanks you so again for the nice talk. And I remind you that we're going to dinner. Please let me know if you're interested.